Welcome back for another episode of the Innovation Room. Today, we're privileged to have John Saunders with us. Um, John's had a long and successful career on Wall Street, uh, most recently as a senior vice president. And um, throughout his career, he's seen the need for, for his businesses and teams to adapt to a rapidly changing world. Um, so he's worked hard as a leader to create a, a real culture of innovation um, in an industry where it hasn't always been business as usual. So uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, thank you for having me, Jesse. I really appreciate it. Uh, I live in the D.C. area. It's a very exciting time to be here uh, with the election in full swing. Uh, I've got a wife and two boys. We've been in the area five or six years and you know, we spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Uh, you know, generally, I would tell you that uh, I think I've spent my entire life just being a very curious person. I think one of the hallmarks of, of and probably why I wrote this book, quite frankly, is that I just love to learn. I look for learning all around me and formally and formally degrees, reading, designations. And I think it's that sort of uh, curiosity has helped land me here uh, and certainly helped my career. So it's, uh, it, you know, and I think about it's hard to believe I spent over two years working on, or excuse me, two decades working on Wall Street <laughs> and landed there, you know, as an assistant. I'll never forget arriving there. You know, I was sending faxes and, you know, making copies and this kind of thing. I was 22 years old and thought, where could this ever end up? You know, after going to college, did I really go to college so I could send faxes? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, 20 something years later, I was running a, a $4 billion a year in sales goal business uh, as a senior vice president. It was just a fantastic run. And now I've had the chance to really follow a passion and move on to really more starting my own coaching and consulting business. So it's, uh, it's been a great run and I'm uh, happy to be where I am. Very cool. Um, as you mentioned, you have a new book coming out soon. It's called The Optimizer. Um, could you tell our listeners briefly what it is about and, and how you actually came up with the idea? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it, in a brief, it's really about delivering results through creating a culture of innovation or, or what I like to call culture of serial innovators or optimizers. Uh, but more so, it's about building a mindset. This isn't something that just happens, right, going to happen by chance. It's about building this mindset of trying to get people to think about how do we constantly improve things as we go? and align that mindset to the company goals and what you're trying to accomplish as a leader. But what's, what, what's been really fun about developing this over a number of years is I found it really can become a contagious mindset and it can really build upon itself, which has been a lot of fun to watch happen and see people elevate, elevate their game. Uh, but I'll tell you, the, the reason I wrote this book is all these years I've spent in the workforce, I found so many people are afraid to embrace change. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and they never really fulfill or deliver all their gifts to the world. And I think it's really driven by an emotional charge, an emotional barrier, uh, because fear, innovation and change can create hiccups. It's a risk, right? It doesn't work every time. And, you know, you have to have an environment where people can feel comfortable taking that risk and knowing that it's not going to work every time. So what I've tried to do is create an environment where people have that freedom, feel that freedom, and aren't afraid to fail, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, ironically, the, the book itself was a, a, a series of optimizations, interestingly enough. Uh, it was funny, last summer a friend said, hey, why don't you write a paper on leadership and just kind of put it out there, on, try to get it published somewhere or something. And so I wrote this paper and then uh, <clears throat> shared it with a friend. He said, gosh, I think you have a series here. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I wrote this series, turned the paper into a four-part series. And then I shared that with another friend who helps people write series for a living for a magazine here in town, uh, Politico magazine. And uh, he helped me really fine tune it over a number of weeks. And then uh, last, I guess late last year, I had lunch with one of my professors from my business school. And he said, boy, I think you have the makings of a book here. And I said, oh man, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> I never thought about writing a book. And then he introduced me to this author coach. And here I am a year later with a book I'm about to publish in just a, a, in a very short period of time. Um, I think like, uh, as you mentioned, one of the, the core um, ideas of the book is, is that uh, innovation is uh, often about optimization uh, instead of like just uh, these huge big things uh, that people often associate with the word innovation. So um, could you uh, like elaborate on, on some of your thoughts there and, and why is it that people usually fail to understand that this like incremental nature of innovation? 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? So many times, I think we, we see the headlines, right? Oh, this person came up with this big idea, and I'll, I'll share a couple examples. But, you know, we never see all the, you know, hard work sort of done behind the scenes that really got them there. And, and we just see the headlines and think, oh, this person was an overnight success and couldn't be further from the truth. But yeah, it, innovation, uh, history has proven again and again that innovation rarely changes the world on its first try, right? Uh, <clears throat> and many times it's born out of, nece- out of necessity right? Go way back thousands of years. We needed fire to stay warm and cook food. <clears throat> we needed vehicles to move ourselves and goods around. And, and my favorite, we needed iPhone filters to make uh, selfies post-worthy, which I think it was a, a big, big necessity that came out of the last decade or so. But when you think about a couple of specific examples, um, you know, a couple of my favorites, uh, you know, Thomas Edison, right? One of my favorite stories to talk about. You ask people who invented the light bulb, and I haven't yet to find a person that doesn't say Thomas Edison. And in fact, uh, I think very few people know that he invented the light bulb 77 years after the fact that Humphrey Davy, an English scientist, came up with the electric lamp. Uh, John Deere, same story. Elon Musk, same story. A lot of people think Elon Musk started Tesla. He joined a year after the fact. And uh, you know what all of these gentlemen have in common is, one, they're not associated with what they made that what makes them famous or they didn't invent what makes them famous uh what they did was they took the time and went through all the stages of making it awesome and accessible to a lot of people uh which is just really interesting to me you know edison after he invented the light bulb uh, it was funny he was in this interview and somebody asked him how does it feel to fail ten thousand times and his response was great he said uh I didn't fail 10,000 times. The light bulb was a invention that had 10,000 steps to it uh, was his response. Mm-hmm. I, thought that was, I thought that was really uh, pretty funny. But yeah, it's fascinating to me that the three guys that are so well known with these particular products in the world, you know, not one of them invented it originally. They went through these step after step after step to make it viable and useful to thousands and thousands of people and then went on to create tremendous success with it. Yeah, definitely. And uh, like as you mentioned, it's, it's not something that just happens over a few years, but it's decades and, and a lot of hard work that, that really goes into all of those stories specifically about the, about the in, in, into innovation in general. No doubt about it. It's, you know, one of the things I actually learned through researching that I didn't know about Thomas Edison was he was actually the father of the research and development lab as we know it today. I didn't realize he actually, one of his greatest innovations to the world was creating a lab for innovation. And he had scientists and uh, fabricators working side by side. So as they came up with new ideas, they could go right to work on building it. And that's, that's essentially the, modern, the model that modern R&D follows today. He invented, you know, 150 years ago, give or take, which is, I found very fascinating about his part of the story. But when, you, when I think about him, it, it, and I think when I think about Thomas Edison, what he really did, it, you know, his superpower, if you will, was to really see failure as learning and to continue to push onward. And so many times, you know, and I, I, getting back to your earlier question, I think we try something, it doesn't work. And we think, oh man, I, I, I've got to walk away from this because it's, it's just never going to work. And talk about resilience, you know, thousands of attempts to make the light bulb. Um, you know, I found a very interesting story uh, about Elon Musk. You, you might've shared with me at some point now that I think about it, where, you know, Tesla is not only, increasing the rate of, of, of their product improvement, they're increasing the rate of change or rate of innovation that they've delivered, uh, which is just extraordinary uh, going through. So they're actually iterating at a faster pace, which is really fascinating to me. Absolutely. Um, how did you then uh, like first get interested in, in innovation and, and optimization as, as a young manager and, and uh, in the finance industry. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, for me, it was just uh, working my way up the ranks. I was always just trying to think, you know, when I, you know, I went to a, a state school in uh, where I'm from in Wisconsin. So when I moved to New York City, I, I kind of felt uh, maybe I didn't have the pedigree to uh, compete with these people on Wall Street that came from much better schools and things like this at the time. And so my strategy was, how do I work harder than, than all these folks? How do I sh- you know, show up earlier, stay later? And as time went on and my career developed, I realized working harder wasn't going to get it done. So I had to, <laughs> had to find ways to work a little bit more, uh, be more impactful, more effective in my operations. So I constantly thought about you know, 
that, that's a question that always rings through my head. Am I operating efficiently and am I operating effectively? And you can't choose one. You have to find a balance between the two. So I've spent a career asking myself, is that efficient? Is that effective? And where's the balancing point between the two that can really be impactful? So I, you know, it's, it, it was very interesting to me uh, as I thought about innovation and going through, you know, the dozens of interviews I did for the book. Um, I interviewed a senior executive at Microsoft and he actually described innovation as optimization. And in fact, I, I kind of debated him about that at the time. And after I thought about it, I realized, oh my gosh, optimization has been my mindset forever. I just never thought about that word for some strange reason. And it's always been about how do I make this incrementally better? I mean, my business plan, I looked at it every quarter and kind of twist, tweaked it a bit to make it more impactful and grow my business. And, and, uh, and then I looked for better ways to tweak it and refine what I did. And so it's just, just this mindset that I developed because I felt like I had to, had to do, find a better way to compete and continue to, to grow in, the, in my career. With that background, I'd really like to hear uh, you kind of like elaborate on uh, and go a little bit more deeper on what you think then really makes a culture or a team or a or a company at large uh, innovative. Yeah, uh, you know, as, as I t- touched on for a second earlier, I, I think it's really a big thing about the mindset. Uh, and I absolutely believe it can be developed. Um, you know, one of the reasons uh, I call the subtitle of the book Lifting the Curve is I would argue when I inherited my team, you know, I'm going to make up numbers here. Maybe they all ranked, say, 40 to 80 on the bell curve, if you will. And going through this process over a number of years, I would argue that at the end of it, you know, maybe we ranked 50 or 60 to, to 90 or 95 at the end. So it wasn't just about helping the people at the wrong end of the curve, if you will, innovate or get more impactful in how they operate, but you can help everybody improve. And I think that's oftentimes uh, uh, a miss I've seen with managers over the years that they think, oh, my best people don't need any help. You know, they can, you know, they're sort of figuring it out on their own. And I would argue they want to be challenged. They, it's harder to do it as, as their leader, as their manager. It's harder to find ways for them to improve because they're working at such a high level already, but they want to be challenged is, is what I found. And if you can find a way to challenge them and then showcase that for your team, uh, that can be very powerful. And, and, by the way, showcase across the curve. If someone who's you know, sort of struggling with innovation is also finds a way to, to, to help the team, showcase that as well. That, that to me was a big part of it, was finding a way to, in a very non-threatening way, and I use that phrase very intentionally because that was feedback my team gave me, you, you challenge me in a non-threatening way uh, to get better. And as anyone on the bell curve found new ways to get things done, I would share it with the team. Hey, everybody, this person found a better way to get this done how do we, how do we all benefit from this now and not take the three or six or 12 months it took that person to get there? Let's now all leapfrog to, to where they are. But I would make sure that as they shared their story, uh, they would talk about their challenges along the way. So people could see this again, this didn't just happen overnight. They spent months trying it this way, tweaked it and so on and so forth. So I believe if you set up this mindset for people, uh, and this culture where everyone is thinking about trying and they can feel you know, safe taking these risks, uh, it can be very powerful. Uh, I've got a, another example from one of my interviews, if, if, if you want me to share that one as well, that I think is kind of interesting. Absolutely. Uh, there's a woman I interviewed, Patty Brennan, just an extraordinary individual. Uh, she's one of the top financial advisors in the United States. She's won just about every possible award you can imagine in her line of work. <laughs> and her team, year after year after year, she's been in business about 30 years, uh, her team year after year sets records for growth. And just when you think they can't do it again, they do it. It's really extraordinary. Just 25 people on her team, which for those who don't know the financial advisory business very well, that's an enormous number of people to be on one team. And one of the things she does, because this, to me, this, this mindset, it's all about enabling and empowering. And what she does is she empowers every single person. And the way she has a number of ways she does it, but a key way that I found in, in, our, in interviewing her was that every single person has a voice in the business planning process. So from the lowest ranking person on the team to her most senior leader, every person has an equal voice in the business plan. And they can raise their hand and say, hey, Patty, I, I think what we're doing here isn't helping our clients as best as it could. We should maybe reevaluate this and here's how I think we might do it. And if someone comes up with a good idea, 
she is not afraid to rip up last year's business plan and implement a, uh, implement a new idea. And one of the ways she makes this work, one, they all have a voice. Two, they set a goal, uh, a new uh, uh, asset goal for bringing in new clients. If they hit that goal, every single person gets the same bonus, which is, I mean, I would almost call that unheard of, particularly in, in the industry. Yeah. So there are other bonuses people can get for individual work, but in the business planning element, they all have a voice. They all get the same bonus if they hit their goal. So she really levels the playing field and builds camaraderie into the team, which I think is just extraordinary. And when you think about, you know, how does she do that? It really gets to one of the core principles of, of, of what I write about in the book, which is vulnerability. It's very difficult for a founder, a CEO, or a founder CEO to stand up and say, I built this business, now I'm gonna empower these people to come and make decisions for me. That is not an easy thing for everybody to do. And that takes an enormous amount of vulnerability, but she demonstrates it over and over again. And think about that message she's sending to her team. We're all in this together. You all have a voice here. We can make this better, but we're, gonna, we're all gonna do this together because you know, there's, there's synergies in working together as opposed to just me pushing everything down from the top. So just an extraordinary example of teamwork and vulnerability. Definitely, definitely. Um, I know a lot of all our listeners might not be in the position of, of being that founder CEO. So, so uh, I know you have a lot of interesting stories in your book also re- using, on using the same kind of principles um, in a perhaps more traditional managerial position. So um, are there any kind of like practical tips uh, or, or principles that you have uh, that you could share? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll tell you one of my uh, favorite examples. Uh, when you think about you know, trying to just motivate folks, I had a, a gentleman on my team. Uh, one of the big elements of the book is creating a feedback loop because in how you operate, it, you know, it just really doesn't happen without communication and building trust. And I'll tell you this, when you first go to your team and create a feedback loop, uh, it's, it, it, people aren't always used to that. And asking them, hey, what's it like working with me? How can we improve our relationship? These types of things. And that is an incredibly powerful exercise. And I think, I think where it came from is, is, is kind of an interesting story. So I might share that. I remember 2011, 2012, I, was a, I wasn't a manager yet. I was a, a contributor. I was a salesperson and, uh, for the company. And my business had taken off in the first number of years. And then it had kind of plateaued. And I remember sitting at our award ceremony one year, and uh, when they were calling the award that I might have won, as soon as they announced the person who did win, you know, I, remember, I remember thinking anxiously, oh, is it me this year? And I remember thinking, boy, uh, as soon as I th- said the person's name, I realized I, I wasn't even in the running. And I was, de- I was deluding myself and thinking that I was, which uh, was painful. And the gentleman that won the, there's one top award the company gave out every year, the gentleman that won it, I ran right up to him and I said afterwards and I congratulated him and I said, his name's Ian. I said, Ian, is there something you did differently this year to drive the results you did? And, and he said, yeah, I, I surveyed my top clients on what it's like working with me. And I'll tell you that, that just kind of blew my mind in 2011 or 12, I think it was 2011, something like that. Nobody was thinking this way, at least uh, not that I was coming across in the industry. So I said, please send me your survey. I tweaked it marginally and set out to do this myself. And it was probably the single greatest thing I did in terms of helping my career evolve. Uh, So I went, set up all these meetings with clients and said, hey, I'd love to get your feedback on what it's like working with me. I'm so impressed with how you operate. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback on how I could improve what I do. And I'll never forget sitting down with this one gentleman, top client of mine, I've worked with him for years and I'll never forget this moment. I said, you know, his name's Mike. I said, Mike, what's your, of all the questions I asked, I thought this was the, you know, the one where it was his chance to tell me how great I was. And I remember asking him, you know, what's the best part about working with my company? And I was thinking, right, this is where he tells me how great our partnership is. He never mentioned my name once, not once. And I'll never forget that moment. It's still, I'm still sort of feeling the sting of it right now, you know, it's 10 (laughs) years after the fact. And I remember thinking as I drove out of there that afternoon, uh, out of his office, I remember thinking, man, this is what brand management is all about. You know, here I'd done all these things to help him and his team grow their business, operate more effectively. And he never, he didn't even consider it in answering that question, which I thought was fascinating. So 
take that little analogy right there. And I took that exact same approach as a leader. So instead of asking clients now at this point, what's it like working with me? I applied that same, same lesson to my team. And it's incredibly, it's an incredibly powerful exercise. And you can't ask all these questions at once. What's it, but you know, over the course of maybe a couple of quarters, I think it's really important to do it. What's it like working with me? How can I improve our relationship? How could our team work together more effectively? And it's interesting. The first time you ask these questions, you will quickly see how comfortable people feel with your relationship or with their career or with their spot in the company, because if they feel comfortable, they'll give you a more honest answer, right? If they don't, they'll say something like, oh, what's it like working with me? Oh, you're great. <laughs> it's, it's nice to work with you and I really enjoy it, right? Uh, so it was really fascinating to take that exercise I learned as a, a salesperson and apply it as a leader and find it incredibly impactful to build trust and get the team more engaged. I'll, I'll pause there. There's, I certainly could add to the story, but happy, <laughs> happy to pause there and see your reaction to it. No, I, I, I think having read your book, I think that was a, a great um, lesson. I think I've definitely been in, in a situation myself uh, and I've seen um, a, a lot of people get in a position where they're, they might be asking for feedback, but then they don't really get uh, anything meaningful out of it, um, which uh, might lead you to believe that there's not much we can do to improve at the moment, uh, which usually isn't true. <laughs> Um, but but uh, what you're saying is that it all comes down to the building that trust first and then kind of like having that, that in place and then uh, doors start to open. And I would add two more wrinkles to that, uh, which are one, it's not a one-time event. You know, much like innovation, it's a series of events to get there with these folks, uh, to get them to trust you. Uh, and two, you have to be willing to do something with the information they give you. You know, nothing is, uh, I shouldn't say nothing, a few things are more frustrating than to have a manager come to you and say, hey, help me out with this project. You do all this work or give them a thoughtful answer on it and then nothing happens. You know, that, that's a quick way to getting people to not give you feedback. And so one, you know, simple example that really was a turning point for me uh, was doing just that. I went to somebody and I said, hey, um, you know, we're, we were a remote team. I said, how can we better communicate as a team? And without delay, this gentleman had been with the firm a long time. He said, we have too many conference calls, too many. And he didn't actually say it quite that nicely, but I'm sort of paraphrasing for everyone here. Uh, but I said, wow, and I hadn't thought about that. It was just kind of in our culture. We'd always had these conference calls. So I just, as when I became a manager, I just sort of kept it going. And I looked at the calendar and said, gosh, if I just knock out the calls that were on a holiday week or a conference week instead in the past I would move them a day or two and allow them to still happen what I did was I just knocked out those that had a holiday a conference call and that knocked out something like 15 to 20 percent of our calls it was unbelievable and so I sent out a note to the team hey everybody uh Brian had an interesting idea I want to pilot it this year see how it goes I'm just going to get rid of a bunch of these calls based on his feedback and see what happens and I, then all of a sudden they saw all these invites disappear from their calendars. So one, I asked him Two, I got his feedback. Three, I publicized it to everybody, you know, so there's, these sound like simple steps, but they're easy to overlook. And then boom, the, the invites came off the calendar. And that little exercise, as simple as that was being vulnerable, asking him for his feedback, empowering him to help drive change. That simple moment was one of the biggest door openers for my team. Because at that moment, they said, holy cow, this guy's paying attention. He's not just asking us questions to make us feel good about ourselves or provide us lip service. He's actually, if we come with a good idea, he's actually going to do something about it. And boy, that was, that really opened the floodgates for the team. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great example of a really simple thing. Uh, but that's very symbolic for, for everyone on the team to kind of like see that, that it's, it's not just lip service that, that you're doing, but, but that you're really serious, serious about it. And, and again, mm -hmm. like think about how simple that was. And, and by the way, having fewer calls, right? Supply and demand. I actually found engagement on the calls go up because yeah. people realized, oh, they're not all the time anymore. They're not sort of, you know, <laughs> all, so when calls came up, people thought, oh, here's a call. I want to get a voice out there. This guy's paying attention. You know, I'm going to be more engaged. And that was, 
that also made the calls more impactful. And let's face it, if, if, let's not forget, if there was something really important I needed to get out to the team on short-term notice, it didn't stop me from adding a, a bonus call, if you will. So it's not like yeah, you're just of taking all these calls away forever. <laughs> if there's a moment, if you need to get information out, you can certainly do it. But here's the sort of the, 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 the punchline to the story. At the end of the year rolls around, and on the last call of the year, I said, hey, everyone, we had these fewer calls. What did you think? Should we bring them back? And I, I think the phrase, the silence was deafening, is my best way to describe what happened next <laughs> on that call. <laughs> so we, we, we left them off, and that's how we continued on for the next number of years. And, you know, our business improved. Uh, so it wasn't like, you know, it was impacting us in, in any you know, negatively. In fact, it had a very positive impact on the team. Exactly. Um, now, if we like, um, we'll get specific challenges uh, for innovation in, in more detail. Um, I know that you, in your book, you've also shared a number of practical things that you think are holding teams and, and uh, people within those teams. And then of course, it, sometimes the leaders of those teams uh, from innovating. Um, so, what do you think are some of uh, some of the biggest ones uh, uh, on that front? And then what are some practical ways to get kind of like past these challenges? Yeah, I think a big part of the change is, is sort of going further back and looking at, so how has change impacted people over time? How have we been conditioned to think about change? And I can tell you from my own life experience and, and uh, in my family and friends, you know, when change oftentimes is announced, uh, it's, you know, it's not always good for you, right? <laughs> Your job cut, pay cut, loss of power, all of these things. And so change often not only comes with risk, but it comes with very negative consequences. And we've, I think many of us have been conditioned to think that way. So there's the, there are these huge emotional barriers. And I think the big four are fear, loss, uncertainty, and shame. And these things linger out there. And I found some really interesting research on shame as I, I was uh, researching for the book that said that we fear shame so much that we will do anything we can to avoid it, as it, it, including not trying something new or not trying to be creative or innovative because we're afraid if we try it and it doesn't work, then we have to go to our spouse, our partner, our friend, our coworkers and say, oh, I tried this and it didn't work, right? And now suddenly I'm, I've now tarnished this perfect image that uh, I thought you had of me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a, that is a very, very powerful force. So this is a huge problem, right? We need change to happen to evolve as a company, uh, as a, a, to evolve our businesses, right? We can't stand still. Standing still is really going backwards. And there's this enormous emotional hur hurdle. And as leaders, we often don't have the tools, the training, or the time to create this environment. I would argue we need to make the time. And that time is part of our job to make people feel engaged, empowered in what they do. And I think if you can even get it close to right, you're going to not only find employees more engaged in the, in the journey, but they're going to be more passionate about their work. Uh, you know, you think about where do you spend most of your waking hours? You spend it at work, right? You sleep and you work and then you spend some time at home in between on the margins of those days. That's our lives. So people want to have a great environment that they work in and be engaged and feel like they're making progress. And I think that's just really important. But, you know, back to this concept of trust. Um, you know, if, if people trust you, if they feel like there's an honest feedback loop going on, you know, chances are good someone on your team sees the flaws, the holes in your business plan and, and client concerns. And if they don't feel open to share that feedback with you, you're, you're going to find it out the hard way which is, oh my gosh, we just lost all of these clients because we had this problem and why didn't anybody tell me? I mean, how many times has that been said in a, in a meeting room? Why didn't anyone tell me? Because they're afraid. They, they feel like if they come forward with bad information, you're gonna uh, be upset with them. And one of my, uh, you know, one story I, I think is interesting around this point is in terms of empowering and, and building trust. So, I, you know, the email story is one, uh, in 2016 or 17, uh, I had a gentleman leave my team and he had one of the smaller sales regions in the company. And so I had to make a decision, you know, should I replace him or uh, should I maybe uh, merge the territory away and give part of it to the uh, people adjacent to him? And so I did a lot of analysis on it and realized, boy, I could actually get rid of this. 
I could get rid of this region, this headcount on my team, if you will, which as a manager is hard to do, right? Many times we're sort of conditioned to think, oh, if I have more people reporting to me, I'm more important and therefore my job is more secure and these kind of things. And I said, you know what? It doesn't make sense to keep this person. I'm going to get rid of them. But before I announced that decision, there was one gentleman on my team, a very tenured uh, person, uh, this gentleman, Dave. And I went to him and I said, Dave, I'm thinking about making this change. And at this point, I wasn't completely convinced to do it, but I was pretty close and the analysis made me, led me to believe I should. But I said, Dave, you've worked in this area for years. You've covered much of this region for years uh, that this other guy covered that left as well. And I said, I'm thinking about not replacing him. I'd love to get your take on what this region should look like if we don't have another person working in it. And he was blown away. You know, he'd been with the firm for 20 something years and, you know, had never been asked for this kind of feedback with a meaningful change. And so he said, can I have a few days? I said, sure. So I don't know, three or four days later, we met at a Starbucks or something and we sat down and he came back to me with all this very thoughtful work on, Hey, here's what I think should happen. He even had some specific asks to kind of get himself a bigger budget, maybe more resources for his team, things like this. And lo and behold, his analysis overlapped 75, 80% with mine. But guess what? Now that he did the work and brought me the ideas, this change effort was largely his. So think about the message that he received there. You know, if your manager comes to you and says, hey, Jesse, I'm going to turn your life upside down and take it or leave it, right? In, in many ways, what's your reaction? You call up your favorite work colleagues and what do you say? Oh, I, you know, I'm really happy with what my boss did or boy, my boss is a jerk and he never lets me do what I want to do, right? So not only did he uh, come up with a lot of the work I did, he came up with a couple of new wrinkles, which we were able to add, which was great in terms of getting him further resources. But because these decisions were his, he was really able to, to, to own it, to, to get, take greater ownership of it. And he spent the next two years, you know, running after it really hard and fast and found himself promoted. So, I mean, think about how a lot of those scenarios play out. Your boss comes, changes your business, turns it on its head in many ways. And what do you do? You get angry, you get despondent, you start to apply for other jobs, you aren't operating at a high level and business falls off. And in fact, this case, we had the exact opposite result and he ended up getting a huge benefit from it. So we all won. The company won. We had a lower cost structure. He grew the business even more effectively and then ended up getting himself promoted. Uh, that, that was a big one. And so I shared the email example earlier, which, I, or excuse me, the conference call example earlier that, right, that's an easy one. Anyone can make that happen. But this one really took, you know, I think in, in my case, being vulnerable and saying, hey, let me empower you to help me make this decision. I think you can make it as well, if not better than me. And uh, it really had a just massively positive impact on our circumstance. Yeah. So uh, from what I'm getting there, I think a lot of the, the principles and, and thoughts that you have there are very much in line with what's generally, I think, considered good leadership. Um, but do you think there's uh, anything like more specific uh, that cultivates innovation or, or are they very much aligned in your view? Interesting. Uh, well, that makes me think of some data that shares that when, when the S&P 500 came out uh, 1964, on average, you spent 30 something years on the list, I think 33 mm -hmm. years. And Intersight, uh, uh, an innovation consultancy, uh, came out uh, recently and said by 2027, they think the average tenure on the S&P 500 will be 12 years. So I, I tell you all of that backdrop to say that I think these two things are tied together. I think as a leader, you have to drive change. You have to get people to evolve to make your business grow and continue to grow. Uh, and I think in doing that, you have to create this culture of innovation, this optimizer mindset to get people to think this way. And I think there's a, a, a number of benefits to it. In addition to just growing your business, if you get people to constantly think about allocating time to this change mindset and this constant improvement mindset, you know, inevitably you are going to have to come to them with a big ask and say, gosh, this time we can't make an incremental change. I need you to take a bigger leap. What, what this mindset I, I believe does is it allows them to be already there. So instead of just taking a small leap this time, it's a little bit further. So inevitably throughout time when challenges arise, you know, you're better prepared for it. 
Uh, so maybe there's something that comes out of left field from the industry or the economy or a competitor or what have you. You have to make more of a radical shift. I think having this mindset, this innovative mindset can really help you be better prepared for that. Is that does that get at what you were asking? Yeah, I think that's, that's very, uh, like, uh, your view is that uh, innovation just has to be part of basically every team and, and everyone's way of operating these days. And you can't really get away without uh, trying to innovate, uh, at least in the incremental kind of way. Um, but then also that prepares you for the, the bigger uh, disruptive shifts in, in, in basically the every industry that's, that's facing these, these days. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it was, it was fascinating to see, as I alluded to earlier, seeing people at each end of the, every part of the bell curve on my team embracing this. And you're, you're probably not going to see the least innovative person on your team if you've identified them yet, come forward with the very best ideas. But what this process can allow you to do is even unleash that person and get them to, to push forward and help the team grow. And then, as I said earlier, you go to the other end of the bell curve, and if you could find a meaningful way to challenge your top people, they're going to come forward with just extraordinary ideas that really help move everybody along. But I think everyone has the ability to do it. So creating this mindset can be just incredibly powerful for leadership and for driving innovation. I think the two things are very much linked. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, if, if one of our listeners is now thinking that, hey, all of this sounds good, but what, <laughs> where do I begin, John? So <laughs> what, what would you say to them? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, start small, uh, start small and, and begin with this simple feedback loop. But I'll tell you, before you do it, before you start asking your team for feedback, I would encourage you to take an idea from Tomas Chamorro Pramuzak, uh, who wrote a book a while ago that I, th I think found a very interesting exercise. And so to get a sense of how your team thinks about maybe not just you, but leadership in general, go to Google and type in my manager is and see what pops up. And spoiler alert, Jesse, not one of them is going to be positive, not one. And so before you begin this feedback loop, just go through that exercise to get a little bit more perspective on where your team may be coming, through, coming from as you begin this, maybe this new journey or refining a journey that you're on. And take some time to reflect on what comes up in those auto populations. My boss is a micromanager. He's out to get me. And just think about that because that's, that's what your brand is. And uh, you're, you know, Jeff Bezos famously said, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, right? It's as simple as that. And so when you think about preparing these questions, and I've got a number of them, I, I list in the book, I, I said some of them earlier, how could I be more helpful? How could our team work together better? A bunch of others. But the most important thing with this exercise, Jesse, is be prepared for answers you don't want to hear. Because it Turns out maybe you're not as perfect as you thought you were, right? And this is where vulnerability plays such a key part. But if you have a focus on ultimately we're trying to help our clients and grow our business, it makes the whole process a lot easier because if you just take it personally, then it's just me against this person. But if you think about it more from the perspective of if we can have a better relationship, we can deliver better for our clients, grow our business. That's, what's, that's where this thing really gets powerful. And so when you hear these things, you don't want to that you don't feel comfortable with and don't think are true about yourself, uh, you know, and, and reflect on them. This is how you grow. And I believe great leaders do this all the time and it gets easier, easier over time for sure as you go through this exercise and, and find this, I'll say, higher level of honesty. Uh, but, you know, as you, as you go through these questions, be thoughtful. Don't, don't force a square peg in a round hole, you know, do it live maybe offer it up on emails, you know, do a, 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 maybe start, if you're uncomfortable with it, start with a, an anonymous survey so people can really feel free to speak their minds it's to get people in that mindset that, hey, we, we're listening and we care and take that information and report back uh, either through any one of these survey formats you might, might go about uh, because that's really, as I suggested earlier with the conference call schedule, I mean, how simple was it for me to do that? And it, that was such a big changer a change for how we, we do things. Um, boy, one of the folks I interviewed, um, David Gardner, uh, who started out, he's the co-founder of The Motley Fool, which is a financial uh, advice company here in the DC area. Uh, he is the master of this. And, you know, co-founder, CEO of a company, but I can tell you, go back 25 years, and it was just him and his brother just kind of writing a letter and thinking it was fun to put on the internet to give people advice. And 
I'll tell you, it was really interesting to hear him share a lot of these same ideas and how he operates. And he has a constant feedback loop with his team. Formal surveys that he does twice a year. He gets the team together face to face to say, hey, all hands on deck, get in the conference room, what's going on everybody? And just keeps it very light and low key like that. And he takes their feedback. And he doesn't just write it on a piece of paper or not write it on a piece of paper. He takes that insight and he tries to use it to make the business better. And something he's done important that I think is incredibly important is he built their mission around this. And I'll tell you, uh, he, he will be the first to tell you that he didn't land on this mission right out of the gate. It took him about half his career to get there, 15 or so years of his 25, 30 years to get there, which is we want to make the world richer, smarter, happier. And I think there's something very important in those words that they all end in ER. He didn't say we're going to make the world rich, smart, and happy. Those have endpoints, right? Oh, I'm rich. I can stop. I'm happy. I can stop. No, no. Happier, richer, smarter. And so he's built this, what I would argue, optimizer mindset into his team by saying, if you want to work on something, if you want to innovate, ask yourself that question. Is it going to make the world richer, smarter, happier? And it makes decisions a lot easier as they go through time. But just a great example of being vulnerable, being a good problem solver, focusing on your customers and engaging your team and empowering them to be involved in the process. We're getting pretty close to the end of our interview. Um, but uh, before we do that, uh, I would like to ask you like to kind of point out one thing that you think um, our listeners should take away from, from your book or from this talk. It, it, you know, if there's one thing I would argue that without trust, none of this is happening, without a doubt. And the bar, I believe, is lower than you think. <laughs> People want to have a good relationship with their manager. And I believe it's incumbent upon the leader to, to begin that, to put out the olive branch and begin this process. Because most employees aren't going to take it upon themselves to come to you and say, hey, let's have a conversation about our, us not working together as well as we could. How many employees are going to have that conversation? Right? It's, it's incumbent upon you as the leader to begin that conversation and empower your team to do it. Uh, and as I said earlier, people want to have a good relationship with their work, with their boss. They want to see progress in how they operate. And if they can be a part of it, that's when they're really going to be impassioned with their work and, and be more engaged in it. And when, they're, when that happens, that's when they start to deliver more results because they start to think about how do we make this place better all the time? And then it becomes this beautiful waterfall effect where everyone gets involved and positive things begin to happen. Exactly. Um, hey, anything else you'd like to add before, before we wrap up? You know, when I think about uh, this engagement idea, uh, you know, when you get people starting to come up with these maybe bigger new ideas for themselves, you know, they're not, they have the ability to not just surprise you with their creati creativity and innovation. But I think they're going to surprise themselves and their peers. And I think it's going to make them happier in just how they operate and more passionate about their work and their lives, quite frankly. Uh, and I think it's really possible for this cycle, this, this feedback loop, this building trust, this innovation cycle to take on a life of its own. And I would argue that it, it really can become much more of a pull as time goes on and your team members will be pulling each other along. And after this thing really gets up and running, you as a manager are really just sort of setting the guardrails so they you know, sort of don't go into the ditch, if you will, and making sure that the innovation... <laughs> or the optimization is focused on, you know, goals meaningful to the business. But I believe this could be a self-fulfilling thing that continues and takes on a life of its own and, and deliver results and, and ultimately have a little fun along the way. Exactly, exactly. Um, hey, uh, where can our uh, listeners find you and your, your book and your other work? Yeah, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn uh, under my name. Uh, I'm on uh Twitter at J Saunders 1313 had to, you know, took me a while to come up with a Twitter <laughs> handle that, that was available uh, on Instagram. JCS underscore optimizer is another place to find me. And uh, yeah, the book will be on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and uh, wherever you buy books online in early December. Perfect. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for, for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me.